Thank you all for coming here tonight. Um, we're all very excited to present what we've learned. Uh, this semester we worked on an ongoing capstone project under the direction of Professor Sanderson to map the historical ecology of ancient Jerusalem. And this is an enormous undertaking. We are in the first capstone class to work on it, nor will we be last. Uh, but we're proud of the work that we managed this semester and we're excited to be here sharing with you. Um, ecor historical ecology is basically just the history of nature. And this is kind of opposed to uh, something like environmental history, which is more about the relationship of people with nature. And our emphasis on historical ecology is reflective of the goal of the project to really move beyond an anthropocentric worldview to really see ourselves as only part of the bigger whole. Um, so our methods for this project are based off of previous work by NYU students and Professor Sanderson to map the historical ecology of New York City in the year 1609 at the time of Henry Hudson's arrival. And basically this project eventually became an interactive online website where you could go to a specific street, click on that street, and see what the natural landscape looked like and what kind of creatures were living there 400 years ago. It's very cool. You should all go check it out. And ultimately, this is what we're hoping to do with the Jerusalem project. So why Jerusalem? It's a very important city. It's a modern and also very ancient city that is sacred to 3 billion people all over the world. It's a very sacred site to Jews, Muslims, and Christians. Um, and it is also a very diverse place. It is located between uh, the Mediterranean, uh, West Africa, or West Asia, and North Africa. And it's been a crossroads for living beings since long before people have been around. And so this quality makes Jerusalem very diverse. In older maps, it was depicted as literally being at the center of the world. But another part of the story of Jerusalem is it's a very contentious space. And people have been fighting over it for thousands of years. And we're not interested in involving ourselves in political disputes. Uh, really, we are trying to create a new way of seeing and understanding this landscape where borders aren't made by human hands, but more by the many complex and nuanced interdependent relationships of the country. As the center of uh, monotheistic religion, our study of Jerusalem gives uh, a lot more understanding <coughs> and context to the development of these religions, uh, as well as the people who first conceived them. But another big goal of this project is to really grapple with an ideology within mono monotheism that believes that human beings, specifically men, are made in the image of God and encouraged to go out and dominate and subjugate the natural world of our own ends. And today, in the age of the Anthropocene, we're now faced to, to reconcile ourselves with the consequences of uh, a very anthropocentric <coughs> And so if we want to live in a world that is more equitable and more peaceful, more sustainable, we have to really uh, embrace a new way of seeing the world that doesn't put us at the very center of it. That's the goal of this project. Okay, for this project, we're focusing on the early Bronze Age, or biblical times. It goes back to the photo, the story of Abraham and Isaac. And it's a key story in all the religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And just in case you don't know, I'm just going to tell you. So the story goes that God told Abraham to go through the wilderness up a, certain, up a particular hill and sacrifice his son. And when he finds Isaac and is ready to sacrifice him, he's told last minute that he doesn't have to, and then he can sacrifice the man that he made instead. For Judaism, this was um, this is proof that they are the worthy people. For Christianity, it's um, it's presiding Jesus' crucifixion. crucifixion. For Islam, it's a symbol of submission to God. All religions look back on this as a key idea, but in different ways, and we are looking at it from an environmental perspective. Many people invest a lot of meaning on this story, but it's not a complete one. The man, the sun, the ram, the thicket, those are the only details we know. We want to know what else was there. We're thinking, was there a ram in the thicket? If, if there was, what else was in there? <laughs> It turns out there's a lot of cool things in there. We want, to <laughs> um, we want to find out what kind of ram was it or what kind of thing it was present. Um, 
uh, people, like people naturally connect to wildlife, we kind of forget how biodiverse the world is in this day and age. And we're aiming to fix that. Through the, though the landscape has changed so much in these past 4,000 years, the importance of wildlife is still remains, and especially in Jerusalem. If you're asking why, it's because it's so biodiverse. Jerusalem is home to remarkable and globally significant levels of flora and fauna diversity, making it a biodiversity hotspot. People came here because of the three distinct biogeographic regions of Herod. There's the Mediterranean, desert, and shrub steppe. Jerusalem is at the crossroads of roads of all three, like my sister said. Um, so some characteristics of the three biogeographic regions. The Mediterranean ecosystems are like the ones of Europe. They have mild, wet winters and warm, dry summers. The vegetation of these areas are dominated by evergreen shrub. <laughs> they are uh, dominated by evergreen shrub, um, shrubs with plants that have leathery leaves. <laughs> the desert is like that of Africa. It's arid, dry, and it gets less than 10 inches of rainfall per year. Plants and animals in this biome has to have to have adaptation that allow them to grow even with <coughs> rainfall and extreme temperatures. And the shrubs that, like that of Asia, has low rainfall and natural grassland. They're different than the desert because they have enough moisture to support perennial grasses and shrubs. Jerusalem is at the focal point between these three major biomes, a point where Europe, Europe, Asia, and Africa come together. So having these distinct biogeographic regions in one location makes it a reason to study. So now we're going to briefly discuss the work of the previous class. The Capstone Forest worked on digitizing the contour lines of the 1906 Kumul map. The Kumul map provides valuable insight into the ancient topography of Jerusalem and familiarizing ourselves with that ancient topography was an essential prerequisite to the research we conducted this semester and research that will be conducted going forward. Here you can clearly see digitizing every line on this Kumul map was no small feat. And after all, discovering the ancient uh, historical ecology of a, of a city is a decades-long process. Once the Kumul map's contour lines have been digitized, the previous class was able to create these additional digital maps that were able to help illustrate where certain conditions exist in and around Jerusalem. These maps show the continuous elevation, soil types, and vegetation types. We use these maps to determine if the habitat and distribution of certain research species are compatible with that of Jerusalem. With these digital maps in our toolbox, our extensive literature review and species research can begin. Our first step was to download and familiarize ourselves with Zotero, a free online bibliographic organizer. We use it to organize and review over 600 references that were potentially relevant to the research our class has conducted this semester. We used a variety of references for our research, including field manuals, archaeological findings, peer-reviewed journals, reference books, and pre-existing online databases. We designated about half of the over 600 references in our Zotero database as potentially relevant to our research. We then created annotated bibliographies for those references we deemed the most useful. After, we sifted through our bibliography to find sources that reference species using their binomial nomenclature. And finally, we entered every cited species into a database designed specifically for our capstone research. In the end, we used about 158 references to generate an expansive list including 1,580 potential species. Each species in this list has its own data page where we are able to link multiple references that mention the same species, making it possible to track how many times a single species was referenced in the Levant. Okay, so one of the spe many species from this list of uh, flora and fauna was the mountain gazelle, gazella, gazella seen here. And for this presentation, we'll be using the mountain gazelle as sort of an example species to uh, further clarify, illustrate the steps of the processes. So after we put together the list of 1,580 potential flora and fauna species, we then added descriptive information to the database big database about each of these species, uh, recording the distribution range, habitats, and historical records for each species. And we did this so we could sort of get a better sense of where we could pinpoint each of these species on a map of the Levant further on. So for example, with the mountain gazelle, you can see it was referenced eight times. And with each reference, we added information about the mountain gazelle's distribution, habitat, and periods of time it was recorded or said to have existed from fossil records. So you can see that it was said to have existed in the Upper Paleolithic era and the Early Neolithic Age, which are times before the Early Bronze Age, and it was referenced also said to have existed in the Middle Bronze Age and several times after 1968, which are after the Early Bronze Age. 
So after we had the more descriptive information about each species, we created an ordinal system of data to uh, measure the categories whether or not the species could be present during the time and place we're focused on. So <coughs> we qualified the species into one of five levels of likelihood from likely to impossible. And we did this based on the number of sources it was found in, the types of geographic regions it was found in, uh, where, where and uh, when it was recorded, and the types of ecosystems it's said to have the chewy. And the two categories of likelihood that we're focusing and expanding on in this class are the likely and probable species. So with the map of you can see that it was sorted into the likely species, and this is because it had uh, more than two references. It was referenced eight times. And it was also found in or near Jerusalem, specifically in the southern Levant. It was also documented before and after the early Bronze Age, and it inhabits ecosystems appropriate to the locality and the time period. So after entering the likelihoods for each of the species we found, we looked at the results. So our database has the capability to allow us to query for a specific taxa and the likelihoods of each of our species, which allowed us to see how many of each category we had. As we can see, of the, the 1,580 total species we entered, a total of 347 species were found to be likely or probable inhabitants of Jerusalem during our specified time period. Additionally, we identified 343 species as possible, 399 species as remotely possible, and 12 as impossible. We noticed that we had fewer likely and probable species compared to the other categories except for impossible, which is probably due to the strictness of our likely categories as well as time constraints. Once again, this process is not finished and will be continued by future teams but this is the portion our team completed. Then we wrote detailed habitat compositions for each likely and probable species. When researching for the habitat compositions, we found at least two sources for each species and gathered information about the species requirements for food, shelter, water, and reproductive resources. These resources are examples of each of the requirements for species. For animals, these conditions are fairly self-explanatory, but for plants, um, a source of food may be a soil type or a nutrient found in soil, while reproductive resources could include dispersal factors such as birds, pollinator insects, or even humans. So here's, here's the composite habitat description for our example species, um, the mountain gazelle. The composite habitat description includes conditions for its food, shelter, and water. Conditions needed for its shelter include the types of habitats it's usually found in, such as mountains, arid uh, plains, and cultivated land. As for food resources, we found it feeds on shrubs, succulents, herbs, and grasses. Gazelles also rely on dew drops as an important water resource, so that was included in the composite habitat description as well. We compiled these composite habitat descriptions in preparation for connecting species to other species and elements that they rely on. The goal of seeing relationships between species is ultimately to create a mirror web that helps us visualize the ecosystem as a whole. So what is a mirror web? A mirror web is basically a representation of the network of interactions between abiotic and biotic elements within a landscape. And every point on, on that uh, representation is represented by a species or an element. And every line or link on that map is um, a relationship between a species and an element. So the example we have here visually represents all of the habitat relationships that were made between species for Professor Sanderson's Manhattan. Manhattan Project, and we hope to kind of create a similar uh, mirror web for the Jerusalem Project of Conexplantation. So in an ecosystem, as I hope everyone as DS seniors knows, um, a species depends on several other elements for its survival, it can't exist as a single entity. So for example, the lion depends on the mountain gazelle for food. But what the mirror web does is kind of take this direct relationship a step further by identifying the indirect dependencies that this lion also has within this web. So while the lion depends on the mountain gazelle for food, the mountain gazelle depends on the hairy thorny broom for food, and the hairy thorny broom requires chalky soil to grow. So in an indirect way, the lion depends on the chalky soil for its existence within a landscape. Um, so using this mirror web thinking kind of allows us to understand how our likely and probable species list that we generated interact together as a unit rather than just existing as a single entity. So before we can actually make a mirror web, we had to enter all the relationship information into our database, and this involved giving each species and the elements 
that it required unique ID numbers, and each of those abiotic and biotic elements were also classified based on their relationship to the species. And breaking down our species <coughs> in this way allowed us to kind of be able to pinpoint where our species could land on, let's say, the soil maps created by last semester. And it also gave us a better idea of what we need to map, uh, what elements we need to map in the future for our species. So that data entry process led us to find that our 347 likely and probable species depend on 845 unique elements within their natural landscapes. And when we looked to find relationships or dependencies between these species and the elements, we found 1,542 relationships among them so far. It is very important to note once again that this process is by no means complete. Um, as a very small research team here, there were limits to the number of species, elements, and relationships that we could find. Um, the Manahata Project, upon its completion, had tens of thousands of relationships, and it took 10 years. So there's still much more work to be done, but once again, we're very proud of what we did. To conclude our team's portion of research with this project, we began creating somewhat of a reference library of all of our likely and probable species in order to support the work of future uh, researchers with the project. And these species accounts included a photo of each species along with its common name in English, Hebrew, and Arabic uh, next to its scientific name. Additionally, we included its historical and modern distribution in Jerusalem and around the world. We included its habitat descriptions um, and also the abiotic and biotic elements that it depends on, and in addition to any human interactions that this species may have. And finally, we included the key academic and religious references that um, mention these species to better contextualize the species moving forward. So this is just a sample of the likely and probable species that we included within our reference library. As you can see, we have uh, birds such as the common hoopo and the European badger and uh, even a naked mole rat. And um, who knew Jerusalem could host such an abundance of colorful and diverse species? And really, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that we face throughout this project. So first, you might be wondering why there are so few species listed as likely. And our criteria was our biggest constraint for why. Um, you might recall uh, Delaney saying that you needed, in order to be considered likely, you need a reference before the early Bronze Age and after the early Bronze Age. So that quickly pushes a species down to probable if there's no before the early bronze age. And then another one was just our time constraint. Um, because of the limited amount of time, we weren't able to enter as much data. So as time goes on, we'll be able to enter more and maybe a species will be able to move up to likely. You might have also noticed the very few birds. So this is pretty similar. Um, our class didn't have enough time to go through all of the bird information. So the majority of birds still sit as possible, really possible, and insuffic insufficient information. But again, moving forward, this will most likely change. Um, and specifically to birds, our likelihood character, uh, categories and the historical criteria makes it really hard, again, in order to find some sort of evidence of a bird existing before the early Bronze Age. Uh, moving forward, we see our likelihood categories as a chance to more specifically to the birds because right now we are not differentiating between a migratory bird, a transient bird, and a resident bird. And then another challenge was our history of naming. So we used the catalog of life as our reference. However, if a species of uh, scientific name was not in the catalog of life, then we weren't able to use it. Um, and then ultimately, our project is research-based and highly inferential, um, and thus it brings a lot of uncertainty. So that is why our literature review and data entry is critical for the future of this project. So how will this work be received given the contentious modern situation of this region? It's important to note that our research is unbiased and not financed. Um, the research <coughs> focuses on recreating the ancient city before it was built, and definitely not on modern conflict. There's still much more work left to be done. We've laid the groundwork for the next semester's capstone, and they will continue where we finished. They should expect to continue working on incomplete species database. Also, they will continue adding object element relations to build their mirror web.
The underlying infrastructure for the Muir web needs to be continuously mapped and improved. Then, disturbances in the ecosystem need to be modeled uh, to simulate changes in the landscape over the seasons. In the end, what will it all mean? At the completion of this, we will be able to determine which animals could have been in the thicket alongside the sacrificial ram. This will provide a new perspective of the historical scene in a modern context. Because we have forgotten that nature, in the form of plants and animals, and water, soil, and wind, we have forgotten a precious and even holy aspect of the story of Jerusalem and the rest of the world. As John Muir believed that one touch of nature makes the whole world kin, the goal of our ongoing project is to rediscover nature's lines on the map that were present long before humans were. Thank you, and the rest of the time is for questions. So for likely species, it was really useful to use archaeological findings, so like bone records and stuff like that that we could find. Um, we spent a lot of time in the library and looking up books that had been published um, many decades ago. For our um, plants, we used a book that was published in the 30s, and it was more of a field manual from uh, Post, who was cataloging pretty much every species he saw that is at least is a plant in pretty much in all of the Levant. And so that was a very extensive part of our project, was going through all of these different uh, references to really add them all to our database. And so our database was really convenient because we could add references by the species, so we could see exactly how many species had what types of references. So a likely species would have been mentioned in archaeological findings as well as a, a field guide like the post book I mentioned and a variety of other uh, references. The Catalog of Life is more used for um, consolidating old names that have been changed. So in the 1932 version of Postbook, he used a lot of um, binomial nomenclature that has changed drastically. And the Catalog of Life basically um, gathers all of those names that have been used and presents it under one commonly used uh, name. Yeah, so I might be a little confused about the Catalog of Life. So is the goal to reconstruct the historical ecologies of what's about 4,000 years ago? Is that right? <coughs> so, um, so then this question is one you may not have an answer for, which is completely fine. Do you have any idea how much ecological change there was, say, from 4,000 years ago to, say, the time of, of Jesus, that, 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 that 2,000 year period? <coughs> As we all know, this uh, location is, you know, a place where lots of, you know, it's a place of modern conflict, but also historically there's been a lot of conflict in the area. So we imagine that a lot of, you know, human conflict has drastically changed the um, ecology of the area. Um, so I, I would say that we expect a lot of change um, from, you know, today, what it looks like today, compared to uh, 4,000 years ago. However, um, as you can see on some of the pictures on this last slide, you can still see some of the vegetation. Um, so clearly there is still some remnants, um, and I, I would say that it's probably more than you would expect um, in researching or kind of familiarizing ourselves with the Manhattan Project. We realize that there's a lot of ecology that we come across in our daily lives that we don't necessarily see um, and in, until you kind of take a deeper look. It's not really present to the naked eye, but once you see it, then you see it. So, yeah. Um, I just want to add that I think within our challenges, we included that um, in the future, we need to map 
how many humans have, have lived in Jerusalem and how that has changed over time, and I think that might better answer your question of, of um, the landscape shift. But that's out of our scope for now. I also think there's like an issue of documentation there because if we're looking at 1932 and the description that Post wrote, it, it'll be like, oh, this was apparent here, but not here 10 years later or five years later or by a different person. So we can't be omnipresent. I think that's, you just can't know. We can't, be, even if there were detailed records, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't be accurate to what 4,000 years ago was today. One general prediction that we had come to the conclusion of is that a lot of the species that we had deemed likely or probable or that were found in archaeological findings would have required a much more lush landscape. And so we assume 4,000 years ago, Jerusalem would have looked a lot greener, like the top left picture you see versus the bottom middle picture that we, that we imagine Jerusalem as now. So I'm just curious if you use any of the biblical texts as references as well. Okay, so there is a couple of uh, resources in the Ars Terra that reference, that are basically a list of all the animals in the Bible. We weren't specifically looking at the Quran or the Bible or the Torah, but the people have made lists of the animals uh, from those texts, so, to, so we can have a, a more biological approach to it. I also think that um, we didn't want to rely on one specific religious text as um, an academic source. So um, we often used our biblical references often in our, in our reference library to better contextualize the species and maybe help people build relationships, like personal relationships with those species, rather than using that as a primary source of, of, of the species possibly being used. Did you guys consider insects at all, or was that too difficult with historical records? Historical records defined as. Yeah, I would say it's, um, we did not focus on insects, so that's pretty difficult. Um, as we said multiple times throughout our presentation, we are just one team um, in an ongoing project. Um, but yeah, no, we didn't focus on insects. Even though we didn't focus on insects, I know that I know that Ashley could over like 500 species. So it's not like we were just leaving them out on purpose. It's that you know the bigger things are there first. <laughs> so one of the interesting things about the Manhattan Project is it shows, uh, it gives you an idea of the, for the topography of Manhattan Island before European settlement. And today, you know, we walk around Manhattan, we rarely think that. Manhattan has any topography. What's <laughs> what's it you know, because it's just all been it's all been so altered. Um, but what's your sense for how the, the the topography of Jerusalem has changed? Do you have do you have clues about that? Should I try to go back to this slide? Yes. So uh, the previous capstone focused on this cool map, which is a really good uh, representation of the ancient topography and how it may have been before, uh, the, as you can see, the dome the, yeah, was constructed. So our capstone was more species specific, whereas the capstone previous to us focused more on topography. And so mapping uh, those digital contour lines was a very extensive project to take on. And so from that, they were able to kind of get these more continuous maps that provide a, a more colorful picture of what the terrain would have looked like, and we use these to inform our species research. So I imagine that in the future, in this decades-long endeavor, like the Manhattan Project was, that there will be more uh, research into that topography and the an ability to create uh, a type of reference like the Manhattan Project has for that. But, but do you think a, a modern resident of Jerusalem would recognize some of the original topography and where they did live and work? That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably not, but that might kind of be nestled into the purpose of this project, getting people to reconnect with what used to be there and what species was that were there and, and the vegetation story. I'll just say, George, there's a there's a valley that's got like just to the left of that little red dot on the left map, and that valley is, is filled in. That's actually where the Wailing Wall is in the plaza. Mm -hmm. But uh, it used to be 70 feet deep, and it's filled up the rubble in 4,000 years. 
So, uh, as you uh, mentioned earlier, the uh, climate has changed since the early Bronze Age uh, in Jerusalem and Rome. But, um, so, have you done any research into the viability of, uh, like, you know, having these species again there in modern day or whatever? Like, yeah. And do I need to rehearse that? Um. <laughs> I think the Israeli government is trying to reintroduce, I think it's a species of roe deer back into uh, the sort of desert area, but I don't think there's a large um, push to try to recreate physically old Jerusalem, um, but I mean our project is focused in what was there, so maybe uh, if this project is received well, people will want to reintroduce uh, native species to the area. So. One last question. There in the back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm new to the concept of a mirror web. Um, how were you able? To, how are we able to make one, and why is it useful? That a mirror web is kind of a representation of the network of interactions between living and non-living elements within a landscape. And so we basically created our mirror web by taking a species, seeing everything that it depended on and what the species it depended on depended on, and um, entering that into our database and within our database um, and giving them unique ID numbers, they'll be connected um, like to show. Sure, um, kind of like that. Okay. Um, that's the one for the Manhattan. That's the one for the Manhattan Project. Eventually, there would be one for the Jerusalem Project as well um, that would show it, the degrees of separation between different elements. And why is it useful? Sense? Why is it useful? Yeah. I would say that if you have a species and you know what it depends on, you can better visualize what the landscape would have been. So if we know that the gazella gazella um, was referenced a lot to be in Jerusalem, that means that everything that it depends on was also in Jerusalem. So, it, hairy, thorny broom was also there. Chalky soil was also there. So it just begins to give us a clearer picture of what existed there and what, um, what the species need. Also, it goes back to mapping it to other things like climate or geology. So as you can see, chalky soil um, is part of this kind of near web um, and connecting everything to, you know, physical abiotic elements also allows us to connect it back to topology, geology, climate, human disturbances, all of those aspects as well.